Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we're going to talk about something a little different. We got a post on our Twitter from... A tweet. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) One might say. So we got a tip from a reporter, Joshua, from the London Evening Standard that in 2017, the iconic diplodocus that greets visitors at the London Natural History Museum will be gone and replaced by a blue whale. Specifically a blue whale skeleton. And I think the most ridiculous thing about this is the fact that they're replacing the skeleton of a dinosaur, technically the cast of a skeleton of a dinosaur, with a skeleton of a whale. And I always feel that it makes a lot of sense to have a skeleton of a dinosaur on display because we don't know exactly what they looked like. There are a lot of guesses you can make based on marks in the bone. You can see where muscle attached and things like that, so you can guess how big they'd be. You can guess from skin impressions what their skin might have been like, but things like feathers or color of the skin or exact shapes and sizes of soft tissue, you can never really tell for sure. So mounting a skeleton is really the best scientific way to display what we know about the creature. But with a blue whale, (laughs) everybody knows what they look like. You can go out into the ocean. Virtually every ocean on Earth has blue whales in them at some time or another. So you can go whale watching if you want to see a whale. If you're really into it, you can get in some scuba gear and you can swim near a blue whale. Everyone's seen those cool pictures where there's a little tiny person next to a huge whale. But dinosaurs, obviously, you can't do that. The other thing is, well... First of all, the Diplodocus has a name. It's known as Dippy, which, how can you get rid of something named Dippy? (laughs) (laughs) Hanging a blue whale from a museum is not a new idea. Actually, it's iconic at New York's American Museum of Natural History. There are some differences. For example, the one in New York is 94 feet long and weighs about 21,000 pounds because it's made of fiberglass, and it's based on photos of a dead whale that was found in 1925, whereas the blue whale that will be up on display in London is 83 feet long and a skeleton and real. But the blue whale in New York has been on display since 1969 and they've even renovated it and when the uh, Irma and Paul Milstein Family Hall of Ocean Life was reopened to the public in 2003, that's when they made sure to make some changes to the blue whale and make it more accurate. Yeah, and going into that hall, it's really striking. You usually enter on the second floor. Actually, you must enter on the second floor. And you go right out, and right in front of you is an enormous blue whale hanging from the ceiling. And as you walk around the edge of the room, you see all sorts of um, scenes set up, different animals in different settings. Most of them are in taxidermy. I think some of them might be false, like the whale. But you see exactly what the animals look like in real life, and that's because obviously we know what they look like in real life. And then you can go down below the whale, you can go down some stairs, and you can look up at it and really see how huge it is. And I like to lay down underneath it and look up at it and really just take in how huge it was, which was pretty awesome. I can't imagine trying to do that kind of thing with a skeleton of a whale. I think of whenever I see a skeleton of like a horse You look at it, and you're just spending all your time thinking like, wow, that horse skull looks really weird compared to what a horse head looks like. And you're not really thinking about, oh, we need to conserve the environment because otherwise all the horses are going to turn into skeletons, which is part of the reason that the curator at the British Museum is using for getting rid of Dippy and putting in the blue whale that blue whales are more relevant to the modern conservation effort than a diplodocus is. We actually have seen a whale skeleton. I don't remember if it was a blue whale at the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum. Yeah, they have it sitting outside the Santa Barbara. It's real, uh, but and it's probably one of the biggest displays, but uh, it's being in Santa Barbara, it's a much smaller scale museum. Yeah, but it's just creepy. Look at that skeletons of things that are alive. I mean, it's it's weird. Um, and then the other, another key argument that they use is 
that the Diplodocus is a fake, you know, it's it's just a cast, it's not the real thing, and they should have the real thing on display because they're a museum. But traditionally, that's not at all what museums are about. Museums are about keeping artifacts around and able to be studied, and then they have an ancillary component, which is showing exhibits to the public so that they care about the environment or they can learn about science or whatever but really the purpose of a museum is a studying institution and so it's true that in a lot of museums the things that you'll see on display are quote unquote fake they'll be casts or replicas or dioramas some, yeah some other type of you know quote unquote fake and in particular like we talked about in our first podcast the black hills institute makes a lot of t-rex casts and ships them out all over the world because when you are trying to dig up things that are 150 million years old you only find so many of them and finding a complete skeleton is pretty difficult so you end up making casts and combining things and so you get a good display well i think like the triceratops i believe in the smithsonian in dc is made of a bunch of different um was a replica made from a bunch of different triceratop fossils definitely not all the same body and that and it makes perfect sense because triceratops bones are especially hard to find because they were such a food source for the other guys and so you can find their skulls everywhere because you can't eat the big horns and the huge frill of bone but finding a leg bone and an arm or i guess a foreleg and a rear leg bone on the same skeleton might be difficult but as far as the public's concerned, you go there and you want to see what the animal looked like or you want to see what their bones arranged into. You don't really care that this might not be the exact original that's 150 million years old. And to that end, <laughs> there's no such thing as a real Diplodocus skeleton. Everyone knows that fossils aren't the actual bone. What it is is the bone is in a layer of rock and over time the bone is replaced by stone. So the a fossil itself is not the actual skeleton of a diplodocus it is itself a version of a replica so it's just not fair to dippy is the moral of the story poor dippy <laughs> i saw dippy about 15 years ago and i went to that museum and it's just awe inspiring and uh, one of the best things that could greet you <laughs> at a museum so Dippy also has a long history, just like the blue whale seen in New York. Dippy's been a part of the Natural History Museum since 1905 uh, because of King Edward VII. He went to visit his friend Andrew Carnegie, saw sketches of a Diplodocus, loved it so much that he had a replica made. Um, actually, he wanted the real thing, but at the time they told him that's Real, too hard to find so we're gonna make you this replica as best we can it has been in the central hall where it greets museum visitors since 1979 uh, actually one cool thing is that during the blitz they actually took it apart and put uh, all the pieces into crates in the basement below the museum to protect it yeah dippy is about 83 feet long according to the bumper book of Dinosaurs by Kron Pym. Who's a British author. <laughs> so he clearly knows his stuff. <laughs> and it was also featured in a few interesting places. So Dippy was in One of Our Dinosaurs is Missing, which is a Disney film from 1975, which talks about the heist of a dinosaur. And in that movie, they actually hide in the mouth of a blue whale, which is kind of interesting. It's an animated movie. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> In case anyone thought Disney was making live action now. Years later, the skeleton model that they used in One of Our Dinosaurs is Missing was actually used in the first Star Wars movie in one of the opening scenes where C-3PO is wa walking by a dragon, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce what the dragon's supposed to sound like. And if you look closely at it, you'd, you'd see, like, that's basically just a sauropod. And it turns out that it's Dippy. <laughs> <laughs> One potentially good thing about this whole thing with Dippy uh, being replaced in 2017 is that 
they might put Dippy on a national tour of England. So if you don't get a chance to go to London's Natural History Museum before 2017, maybe if you go to England afterwards, you'll still be able to see Dippy. So that's today's rant. And uh, there's actually a campaign on Twitter right now, hashtag save Dippy. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, tweet something with the hashtag save Dippy. Also, the uh, London Evening Standard is taking letters to the editors, so we encourage you to email if you are like us and would like Dippy to remain. Yep. So, for obvious reasons, our dinosaur of the day is the Diplodocus. It lived in the late Jurassic, which was a, roughly 148 to 155 million years ago when Diplodocus was around. Diplodocus's name means double bean. Uh, it may have lived as long as 50 to 80 years. It's also one of the most slender dinosaurs, um, as in actually the bumper book of dinosaurs points out, much more slender than the Apatosaurus. So the lighter weight that we mentioned and the skinny um, skinniness of the dinosaur as compared to other sauropods may have allowed it to go on two legs. It may have been able to rear up on its hind legs like a horse or something. But that's also a bit controversial because it's obviously pretty difficult to do that kind of thing. The juveniles might have been able to do it because juvenile apatosaurus could run on two legs because yeah, <laughs> they could run faster away from predators. That's cute. Diplodocus is also one of the most uh, on-displayed dinosaurs in the world, on display in the most museums. Yeah, part of that's due to the fact that there are actually a fairly large number of Diplodocus fossils that have been found as compared to some of the other sauropods. There are some sauropods that we'll talk about in later episodes where they only have found, you know, one or two bones and we're trying to guess the size of the dinosaur. In fact, um, Spinosaurus was that way for a long time. We had only seen a few bones. So when the when Jurassic Park 3 came out, they were mostly still guessing back then about what the size of the dinosaur was and what it looked like. It wasn't until uh, late 2014 that the studies came out really, where they had more evidence to suggest that it spent a lot of time in water and, and a few other things that were only guesses before. So I realize that we haven't done a quick outline of the biological classification system. A lot of people remember the mnemonic devices from high school about the kingdoms and all that. So I just want to go through them real quick. So you've got, at the highest level, you have the family tree of life and you go into the domains and then you go into the kingdoms. Everyone talks about the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom. Um, then you have phylums, you have classes, which are sometimes called clads, orders, then you have families, and families, especially in, I see a lot in dinosaurs, they'll break down into subfamilies or other um, subgroups of the family. Then you have the genus, and then finally you have the species. So in Diplodocus's case, it's in the order of sauropods and the superfamily of Diplodocoidea, and the family is Diplodocidae. So inside the family, there's the Dipl Diplodocus, the Supersaurus, and a few other dinosaurs, which are considered some of the longest things to have ever lived, especially on land. Several of them have been found over 100 feet long, and actually the Diplodocus was considered the longest dinosaur for quite a while until longer dinosaurs were eventually discovered. Probably one of the coolest things about Diplodocus is its whip tail. Um, scientists think that it may have been able to break the sound barrier. Actually, a paleontologist who came up with that theory is uh, Phil Curry, who we have an interview with in a later podcast episode. The tail could have made a bullwhip sound to either scare predators or could have been used for courtship purposes. Yeah, it also reminds me of my favorite dinosaur, which is the Ankylosaurus, who had a big club on the end of his tail. So the idea of 
dinosaurs kind of lumbering and moving slowly, they actually had quite the fierce tails in some cases. There might have been a lot more mo movement and quick action. Imagining a tail breaking the sound barrier is pretty impressive. In 1990 in Wyoming, they actually found a Diplodocus fossilized skin impression, um, which showed that the tail had a row of spines that may have run all the way up the vertebrae to the neck. This was made of keratin, which is the same thing you know, as our hair and fingernails, so that's why it's pretty hard to find. Yeah, that would be considered soft tissue, like we were talking about, where you can't really tell exactly what a dinosaur looked like, because unless you get an impression or something, you never really know what could have been out there. Diplodocus had different teeth from other kinds of plant-eating dinosaurs. It had teeth that could strip leaves off instead of biting leaves in clumps. So you imagine the dinosaur chomping down in the middle of a branch and then running its mouth out to the edge and stripping all the leaves off at once. So because its teeth were made for stripping, not necessarily chewing, it also had to swallow stones to help digest its food. It also had the ability to regrow teeth quickly, kind of like a shark, you know, with all that biting on bark and sliding your mouth down the branch, you're going to wear out your teeth pretty quickly. So it needed new teeth. And there's some controversy about how flexible its neck was. Some people think that its neck was so flexible that it could get really high elevation branches and low level things and all in between. Other people think its neck may not have been that flexible, so it may have had to move its whole body from side to side like some of the other sauropods did. And I think one of the most interesting theories is that part of the reason its forelegs are so much different than its hind legs is that it could have been eating aquatic plants where it would stick its head underwater or at least graze the surface of the water and chew up plants from that position. But in either case, it was eating plants most likely that other sauropods weren't eating, so it didn't have too much competition for its food. We're not sure yet how Diplodocus laid eggs without them breaking. They may have built soft nests out of vegetation, or they may have squatted down, but there's also a theory that they'd have a, a tube of soft tissue-like muscles that could pass the egg down on its way to the ground at a slow enough rate that it would hit the ground softly, but there's no soft tissue remains that we found anyway to support this theory. We also don't know too much about how it took care of its young, whether it kind of left them on their own to survive or uh, kind of protected them until they grew big enough to not be a food source for Allosaurus and other carnivores at that time. Uh, just a few other facts about Diplodocus. Its front limbs were shorter than its hind limbs. Most Diplodocus museum displays are gifts from Andrew Carnegie. He donated a, a lot of casts to different European monarchs. Uh, paleontologists used to think that Diplodocus had a second brain, but they figured out later that it was just an enlargement in the spinal cord in the hip area. Uh, but this enlargement was actually bigger than the Diplodocus's brain. Hmm. And Diplodocus had five-toed feet, very similar to elephants, but it's got a uh, thumb claw on one of the toes on each foot that it probably used for protection. So our fun fact for today is, according to Schmitz and Motani in their paper, Nocturnality in dinosaurs inferred from scleral ring and orbit morphology. Diplodocus may have been what they call cathemeral, which basically means that it would nap and get up and walk around and eat at kind of random intervals throughout its whole life. So in a 24-hour cycle, you wouldn't really know if it would be asleep or up wandering around. So it's not really, um, can't really be limited by the nocturnal or diurnal because it just kind of got up and ate when it wanted to. So that'd be pretty interesting to see. I can't think of any modern animals that do that, although I'm sure someone can prove me wrong. <laughs> so that's all we have for this episode of I Know Dino. 
As always, you can find out more at our website, inodino.com. And if you like our podcast, you can send us a tweet at inodino or go to our Facebook page, which is inodino, or send us an email at plesiosaur at inodino.com. Anything else inodino related? (laughs) And if you want to see where you can find a Diplodocus or other dinosaurs near you, you can also go to inodino.com and look up our map of museums and find one near you where you can see some real dinosaurs up close personal. Dinosaurs up close personal. Dinosaurs.